doing this because there's so much going on, so many people that are sick and so many struggling and going through issues. And I just want to acknowledge that uh, that is something to deal with, right? That we want to make sure that in the midst of all the chaos and all of the confusion that we know that Jesus Christ is here in this place today. That it uh, does not matter a whole lot about what's going on as long as Jesus is in the place. As we were singing, I was, I was, just, uh, I was just reminded, thinking of uh, the disciples right after Jesus was crucified. And you know what they felt like. They were discouraged. They were disillusioned. Their hopes had all been dashed. They were hiding in a, in a place with the doors locked and the windows shut because it said they were afraid of the authorities that were out there. And uh, in that chaos and in that atmosphere, all of a sudden Jesus appeared in the room with them. They didn't know how he got in there, but there was Jesus in the room. And everything changed as a result of that. Am I right? You know, they'd been afraid before. They were running for their lives. Now Jesus was there. It made all of the difference. And that was kind of what I felt as, as I came in. It was like, you know, there's a lot of discouragement and a lot of frustration and legitimately so, questions that are out there. And then as you came in, Jesus came in with you. I could feel the Spirit just kind of lighten up and know that we have an assurance. We have something to look forward to. So I just I wanted to encourage you that way just before we started this morning. That, that wasn't in my notes, so that was free. You can have that. Um, and it's so good to see Kelly, who uh, worked with us up in, um, in the Twin Cities. Um, long story, I won't go into all the details, but we have just appreciated her so much. I've been for the last, I, I had stepped back from full-time ministry a few years ago, and then over the last year had been helping out with a church up in Shoreview, Hope Christian Church, and, uh, and got to know Kelly as she and another church merged with Hope, Freedom Community Church came, and she was part of that deal and has been working with children's ministry, and and then one day I was sick, and I wasn't able to go to a meeting, and she went to a meeting and met Pastor Havinga, David, and uh, next thing I know, she's coming down here to be your children's minister. So <laughs> was uh, interesting the way God brought that all together. It's so good to see you again, Kelly, and just see you in this place. Um, and I, I know that the children are uh, on... Um, that there's not as many of them here today, so as a result, you're not having children's church this morning. Okay, just to make sure. Unless any of you feel really childlike and you'd like to listen to her instead of me, I'm sure she would accommodate you. So, um, such a joy to be here in Esterville, Iowa. Um, get out of the city, come to the country and enjoy it. Um, you know, when I was a kid, I, I enjoyed visiting my grandparents down in Coffeyville, Kansas. You know where Coffeyville is? Southeastern corner of the state down there. Good farm country. And uh, my f grandparents lived on a farm where my grandfather m milked a few dairy cows and had some hogs and some chickens and, you know, grew a few crops out in the place. And as a kid, I used to love to go down there and visit them once or twice a year and spend some time on the farm with my grandparents, and um, particularly enjoyed tagging along with him, whatever chores he was doing. One day I was coming in with him on the back of the tractor. He was driving from the field in through the barnyard, and I was standing behind him on the trailer hitch of the tractor, hanging onto the seat, right? Um, I was maybe 10, I don't know, 11, about the age of, how old are you? You're nine. That was about that size. And, uh, and so I suddenly, I, I just got an urge as we were driving through the barnyard. The barn was right there. I thought, I'm just going to go in and, and check on what's happening in the barn. I don't know, but just this whim, you know, kind of a spontaneous decision. And so I, I prepared to jump off the back of the tractor. And I know it's not recommended these days. We've got to really be safe. You know, riding on the back of a trailer hitch is probably not the safest idea. 
to do, but you know, that was the way we grew up in those days. You know, we, we even, you know, we didn't have seat belts and we didn't have bicycle helmets and all, all you know, we, the rubber stuff on the playgrounds, we never, I, I've climbed on monkey bars with solid asphalt underneath it. That's just the way we were. So I didn't think anything special about riding in the back of the trailer hitch of the tractor. And, and besides, I was nine, 10 years old. I knew what I was doing. So I calculated very carefully, you know, the speed that we were going and how far it was to the ground and all of that stuff. And uh, as we came by the barn, I just kind of released myself from the back of the tractor and I hit the ground on my feet perfectly, except for one thing. I would calculated the speed, I calculated the distance, but I had not calculated what was on the barnyard ground. You can imagine, I landed in this this uh, soft, slippery, gooey, and it wasn't mud. And before I knew what happened, I was lying flat in my back, spread eagle, and I could feel this warm ooze soaking in the back of my shirt and my pants, and I laid there just completely miserable. I'm feeling awful, and I'm going, ah, oh, this is the worst. And my grandfather, who must have sensed that I had somehow left the tractor suddenly, stopped the tractor a few feet away, and he turned around and he looked back at me, laying there in, on, in, in, the, in the muck, and he started to laugh. He, and it wasn't just a little chuckle either. I mean, this was like loud guffaws and belly laughs. He, he was enjoying himself at my expense. I laid there feeling miserable, and he was just happy, <laughs> looking down. And I thought, what, what was the difference between his response and my response? And I'll tell you what I think it was. Perspective. He was looking at the situation from up above, looking down, I was looking at that situation from down in the mess where I was stuck. There's a whole lot of difference in how we respond to something based on what our perspective is, how we look at something. How we look at something makes a difference in how we deal with something. So there I am laying there in the muck. My grandfather's laughing. He didn't continue to laugh. He stopped the tractor, got off came down to where I was, and he picked me up out of the mess, and he said, come on down to the pond. And we walked down to the pond, and he washed my clothes off with me still in them, and uh, got me a, a little more cleaned up. And, uh, and yet, I, that word perspective, I think, is what I want to talk about today. How do we look at things? How do we see the problems that we deal with in life? How do we how do we deal with the situations that come and, and just want to rob our faith or undermine our confidence in the Lord? How, what do we do with those things that just come along to kind of mess with our heads and our thinking that want to strike fear into our hearts and lives? How do we deal with those things? What do you do when your ki grandkids are in the hospital and, and your, your spouse is in the hospital? Or what do you do when, when something rages through the community? Um, what do you do when, when the Jews are out there chasing you and you're hiding because G your, your leader has just been crucified? What do you do? Perspective makes all the difference. And if you're, having, if you're having trouble coping with life, dealing with situations, if your problems seem insurmountable, like you don't know how to handle them, how to overcome them, how to, what to deal with them, if, if you're discouraged at all by the mess that you find yourself in, you know, so that you're, you're hopeless, you're even sometimes unable to function, you're emotionally paralyzed or crippled. If, if you're feeling those kinds of things, I mean, obviously you pray. You want a solution. You want a way out, right? You, you, you trust God. You want Him to fix your problems and remove your troubles. And that is good. We do pray. But can I also suggest something else? In the process of praying and bringing things before the Lord, could I suggest that it might just be possible first 
even before God fixes things, that God might fix your attitude or your perspective, that we could use a new perspective. We could, we could ask God to help us see things from His point of view up above, looking down on the mess that we're in, instead of seeing things from our point of view down under the problems that are in our lives. So here's the deal. It doesn't matter. I don't think it doesn't really matter what happens to the problems that come into our lives. Whether they're solved or not, whether our prayers are answered now or whether our, the answers to our prayers are delayed or whether the answers to our prayer come in a different way than we had hoped for or anticipated, I think we need to learn to see things from God's perspective more than our own perspective. Would you agree? I, I, I think that that's something that's part of the growth that God has for us as believers. We, we need to, if we're going to go to the pond and get washed up, the first thing is uh, that we need to have our perspective that we need to be cleaned up and that our God is going to take us to help us and get us through all of this. There's a scripture in 1 Peter chapter 1 I want to look at today. And let me just tell you that he, Peter wrote this letter in the first century to believers who had, were facing a lot of problems, many hardships, great difficulties, even persecution. They were living in a in a, a culture that was antagonistic to Christians. In fact, just a few years after Peter wrote this letter, uh, the emperor of Rome, Nero, unleashed incredible antagonistic attacks against the believers. Even, you read history, even burning some of them alive. And Peter himself, within a few short years, according to one of the early church leaders' origin, was crucified upside down in Rome. So it was in this sort of a, a harsh climate that, that Peter wrote these words. And uh, actually, I'm going to start with verse 1. It says 3 up there, but verse 1 it begins by saying, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who reside as aliens scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. That word aliens, scattered, or as the NIV says, exiles that were scattered, uh, literally, it was diaspora in, in the, the Greek. It referred originally to Jews that had been spread around the whole region. But in this case, it seems like he was using it not only for Jews, but for any believers, Gentile believers, Jewish believers, who were, were living as foreigners in the world. They were, they were living amongst unbelievers, okay? So it, it, that's why it's so appropriate for us. We live in this world as foreigners. This, this world is not our home, right? Our homeland is heaven. That's our destiny. That's where we're going. In the meantime, we might be like refugees, aliens in a foreign land, but, but we know where our home is and we know where our confidence is and it's not in this world. And so he's writing to these people who are aliens scattered throughout this region who are chosen, he says, verse 2, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father by the sanctifying work of the Spirit to obey Jesus Christ and be sprinkled with His blood. May grace and peace be yours in the fullest measure. Grace and peace to people who are on attack, who are being pursued by the world around them. Grace and peace be yours in the fullest measure. Verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope. Now there's a new perspective. To be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Just like in that room where they were hiding out. The resurrection made all the difference, changed their whole perspective. To obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. Here's an eternal perspective, our homeland. 
who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. A faith-filled perspective. Verse 6. In this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials. You feel distressed by various trials at times? This verse is for you. What happens? So that the proof of your faith, being more precious than gold which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, but believe in him. Here's a perspective based on things that you can't see, invisible things, things that you can only see by faith. You believe in him. You greatly rejoice with joy, inexpressible, full of glory, obtaining as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. Aliens, exiles, Good News Translation calls them refugees living in a foreign land in the midst of a godless world. We shouldn't get too comfortable in this world. Because in a sense, we all are uh, like refugees. We live in a godless world surrounded by scoffers and skeptics. We're, we're pressured by by warped philosophies and broken ideologies. Uh, we, we're confronted daily by the ways of the world and, and by sinful behavior. So we should feel a little bit out of place. Wouldn't you agree? Just It's like we're not entirely comfortable here. We don't really totally belong here. It's, it's where we live and, and we're, we're, we're active in this world and we're trying to do our best to make this world a better place. But this world is not our home. So if worldly ways and chaos have bothered you, if politics have bothered you, if you've struggled with worldly troubles or you've had to deal with the temptations that are out there, or even if you're merely facing the challenges of life, I'll tell you that the words we just read from Peter, his advice is still on target today for us. Peter reminds us that, that we're living like aliens in a foreign land and there is a better way. There is something that we can look forward to. There's another way of looking at things. And so I want to just mention three of those things that you can find right in this passage. The first one is this. There is a better perspective. We've been talking about that. He said in verse 3, you're born again to a living hope. There's nothing like like being born to change your perspective. A newborn, think of it. Think, it's for the last nine months, that newborn has been sitting there comfortably and warm and taken care of in, in his mother's womb. And then all of a sudden, everything changes. Like in a moment, he's just pushed out of that comfort zone into a place that is scary and unfamiliar. He's never been there before. And, and, and some stranger grabs him by the ankles and lifts him up and slaps him on the bottom. I mean, that's going to be a different perspective, am I right? And, and, and there he's slapped on the bottom. A rush of cold air comes into his lungs. He goes, <gasps> what's that? And then you know, just all of the stuff that goes on as a newborn, starting out a new life, new perspective. We've been born again. It's a whole new perspective, a different way of looking at things. And it's not all pleasant. Sometimes there are challenges. Sometimes there are difficulties to deal with. Sometimes there are issues that we have to confront or overcome. But there we are, this, you know, like a new baby. The light comes on and you blink and you try to figure out what's going on. That's what's happened when, when God gives us a whole new perspective by being born again. We get a better perspective than our old one, a perspective now that gives us hope. We've been born again to a living hope. And that's something to pay attention to. It's not just any hope. It's a living hope. It's not a dead hope. It's not a stagnant hope. It's not a dormant hope. It's a living hope. It's a hope that has energy. There's vitality to it. There's, there's, it's got the essence of life in it. It's living because it's based on the resurrection. 
It's based on the resurrection. Living is what describes what hope should really be all about. You know, the leaves are just starting to come down where we are. I, and I'm a little disappointed that there weren't more colorful leaves on the way down here. But I'm, I'm anticipating that. But when, you, when your le- backyard gets filled with leaves and you, you go out there and you start raking, you pay attention to those leaves because they've all left the tree. Now they're lying there on the ground. Some might have some nice colors, but they're all kind of brittle, dry, you know, um, crispy. There's no life in them. They're, they're, they're gone. They're done for. And, and uh, shriveled up, it's the opposite of what hope should be. I mean, you compare a dry leaf on the ground with a new leaf that's just sprouting in the spring on the tree. On the tree. Um, that leaf is fresh, alive. It's full of chlorophyll. It's conducting photosynthesis. You know, all kinds of stuff is going on. It's, it's sucking in carbon dioxide and water, and it's pulling up potassium and magnesium from the ground and is collecting energy from the sun, soaking it in. Now that leaf is alive. All that stuff is going on because it's alive. And, and you see that, that, that expectancy and activity. That, it's like a little tiny manufacturing plant with, with all this stuff going on. It's m- making glucose, sugar for the tree to live on. That's what's happening because it's alive. Not like the dead leaf laying on the ground. A tree that's full of green leaves, full of life, is a picture of hope, a picture of of life. It's not dormant and it's not stagnant. Here are the little leaves, you know, they're they're little workers. They just keep going. They've got life in them, so they just keep plugging along, keep chugging along, because something's going on inside of each one of them. They're not like uh, a a lot of workers that you see today, you know, they might might protest uh, they, they might go out on strike. They might uh, they say, For, forget about it. I've had, I've had enough of this. I'm tired of this sun to morning uh, to sunset uh, work hours. I want 40 hours a week. Can you imagine a tree full of little tiny protest signs with all the leaves protesting, going out on strike? I've had it. I want three weeks vacation in July. No, no. if you're a leaf, you're alive. You're, until you're, you're no longer alive, you've got that life going on and, and that, that stuff going on inside of your life where you... You are doing something. Living hope does something. Living hope keeps moving forward. Living hope is, is trusting in God. Living hope is full of energy. It's full of activity. A living hope does something. A living, a living hope expects something. A living hope produces something. That's, that's because it's alive. And it's alive because of Christ's resurrection. It's the resurrection of Christ that makes it alive. Um, I, I think... If we could just keep the resurrection in the center of our hearts and our heads and we go through issues and problems and challenges and we get frustrated with life, if we could do that and see the resurrection in the midst of all of that, it's like that old song, because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Right? Because he lives, we can face tomorrow. It doesn't matter what what comes along. You know, at times we might feel hopeless, Unable to face tomorrow. But then I remember, because he lives, I can face tomorrow. There might be times we hit a few snags or problems or bumps in the road, but what? Because he lives, we can face tomorrow. There might be times when a difficult situation comes up and just tries to suck all of the life and vitality out of us. But because he lives, we can what? We can face tomorrow. Problems might rise up like mountains that need to be moved by faith, but because he lives, we can face tomorrow. Discouraging circumstances can come along, drain away our spiritual energy, but because he lives, we can face tomorrow. At times, we might feel like a pile of dead leaves, all all lying on the ground. Summer's over, our best days are gone, that's the end of it, we have no living hope. But because he lives, we can face tomorrow. And when you feel like a pile of dead leaves, and we, we all go through situations like that, what do you do? When you hit a wall, where do you turn? What, what can you do? When hope has died, can it be resurrected? If Jesus Christ is resurrected from the dead, then our hope can be resurrected, right? 
Try this. Open up God's Word and turn again to God's promise. And even if you've lost your way, even when your spiritual vitality has been drained away, even when you don't feel like you can pray, God can still speak to us through His Word. These are living words of hope. Living hope. Read God's Word again. According, the Scripture says, according to His great mercy, He's caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And that phrase, according to His great mercy, reminds me of this passage in Lamentations chapter 3 where it says that the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I love that passage. And you know, it's interesting because it's planted right in the middle of this book called Lamentations, which is not a very uplifting, encouraging book. It's really a lament. It's a poem about tragedy. It's, it's kind of a funeral dirge for the city of Jerusalem. They've reached the end. They've been conquered. All their, their people have been hauled away as captives to a foreign land. And this is it. End of story. That's kind of where it's at. And there in the middle of this passage uh, of all this, this uh, doom and gloom and, and despair, uh, shockingly, right in the middle of that are these words of hope. And, and in fact, the, Jeremiah, who we believe wrote the book, was a prophet at that time. And in verse 21, he says, I call this to mind. In other words, he made a conscious decision where he said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to think about something different. I'm going to call this to mind. And because I can call this to mind, I get a new perspective. I get new hope. I get a whole new perspective. This I call to mind, he says. And therefore, I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in Him. Because He lives, I can face tomorrow. There's a better perspective. The second thing that I pull out of this passage is that there is a better protection. Verse 5 says, You are protected by the power of God through faith. The NIV says shielded. You are shielded. God's power protects you or shields you, I think not only from trouble, which happens more than we probably realize, but His power protects us from wrong-headed thinking and bad attitudes and perspective. You catch that? It's not just the trouble that He protects us from, but he, because we know we have troubles in this world. We're aliens and refugees in this place. But he also protects our thinking and our hearts and our attitudes so that we don't go down a trail of doom and gloom. But we continue to have hope and faith and trust in the Lord. God wants us to tap into his power for this supernatural faith and, and believing and trusting in him. In fact, the word for protects is the same word that Paul uses in Philippians chapter 4, verse 7, where he says, the peace of God will guard your hearts and minds. Remember that passage? The peace of God will guard your hearts. Same as the word protects in 1 Peter 1. It was a, a, a military word. It was used when they would station troops at a garrison back in the first century to guard the city gate from intruders. I guess you could say it was like the ancient equivalent of homeland security. It was there to pre keep out the bad guys, to keep out the terrorists, guarding against acts of terrorism, and, and, which are intended to, to make us fearful and strike anxiety and consternation into our hearts. So here's the, this guard that God puts around our hearts and our minds to protect us from those bad ideas and that wrong-headed thinking and the idea that undermines our faith. If you believe, putting your faith and trust in God, Peter says that God's going to guard you, protect you. Paul says in Philippians that he's going to guard our hearts and our minds. So even if trouble comes knocking at the gate like some kind of spiritual terrorist trying to come in and make us fearful. Even if suffering 
brings difficulties and pain, the Scripture says that God's going to guard our hearts and our minds. We're protected. So what does that mean to us? Well, for one thing, it means we don't have to worry. That's what Paul said in, in, in Philippians 4, verse 6. He says, be anxious for nothing or don't worry about anything. Don't fret or worry, says one paraphrase. You don't have to get bent out of shape when this world starts unraveling and when things start falling apart or when you face troubles at work or when, when you go through some misunderstandings with friends or maybe you face some economic problems or health issues, hello, or anything. It doesn't matter what we're facing because God's with us. He's going to guard our hearts and our minds. God, God's protection can prevent wrong thinking and bad perspectives and the influences of a godless world. He can protect us from mental, emotional, spiritual terrorism that, that wants to invade our hearts and our minds. So it's by faith that we link our perspective, our thinking, to God's. It's by faith that we do that. By faith, we can choose to connect our hearts and our minds to see God's power. It's by, by faith, we don't have to dwell on what the world says, but we can start focusing on what God says. Or for that matter, we don't have to dwell on what, you know, our worst inclinations might say. But we can focus on what God says. We can choose to join with God to protect our hearts and our minds. Proverbs 4.23 in the NIV says, Above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. And I like the Good News translation. One of my favorite uh, verses, they puts it, it puts it even more dis directly. Be careful how you think. Your life is shaped by your thoughts. If you don't take anything else away, just take that away today. That if God's guarding your hearts and your minds, you can be careful with how you think. And that's going to shape your life. A lot of people who get down in the dumps and they get so discouraged and they can't think of anything positive, do you think that shapes their life? You better believe it does. But somebody who has faith and confidence in God and they're careful about how they think, they dwell on the, the better things, the good things that Paul talks about, in Philippians 4, think on these things. Do you think that shapes their life? Of course it does. Be careful how you think your life is shaped by your thoughts. God can protect you from hopelessness if you learn how to guard what you think about. With, with faith, you can see things differently, and you can reshape your life. Whole new direction. Don't have to fixate on the problem don't have to see things in the worst possible like, oh, that always happens to me, or, or that uh, n nothing ever good happens to me. I, I never get a break. Those kind of things you can get rid of if you allow God's faith to help you be careful how you think, guard your thinking. God has a different perspective, and we can choose to believe God's perspective. That's a choice we make, to believe his point of view. If you're born again to a living hope, and you look to God's perspective, and you depend on his protection, then you don't have to be afraid. You don't have to be depressed, discouraged, upset, none of that. You don't have to do anything that the world can throw at you. You know that God's got your back. He's going to see you through. That does not mean, however, that you won't have problems. I think we've already established that living in this world means there are going to be problems. We are going to face hardships in this world because we're living as refugees in a foreign land, and that can be difficult. You will face trouble. You will deal with stressful situations. Christians do not get a pass living in a broken, sinful world. But here's the thing. Number three, there is a better faith. A better faith is going to help you deal with all of these problems and troubles in life. In fact, the Good News translation says that the purpose of the trials and, that you, you suffer, the trials and troubles, is to prove that your faith is genuine. You ever think about that, that faith has different adjectives? That there's some faith that is, is bad faith, some faith that is, is discouraged faith. There's some faith that is good faith, proven faith, tested faith. Trials prove that our faith is authentic. 
Trials pr can prove that our faith is real. It's not an artificial faith. It's not a superficial faith. It's a real, authentic faith. And the way we find that out is by proving our faith, going through trials. Proven faith has been tested faith. We've gone through those tests. In fact, really, we only ever know that faith is genuine when it stood the test, when we've gone through a problem and come out on the other side. Without being tested, faith isn't proven. It's, it's authentic when it goes through the fire. Peter uses this example. He says it's just like gold. When it goes through the fire, it's refined. How does that work? You refine uh, an ore, like gold ore, by putting it into the fire, and all of the impurities are, are melted out. The gold is melted, and the impurities float to the surface, and then they're able to skim them away from the purified, refined gold. It's the way that it works. And so you imagine going through this fire, and as you go through the fire, the impurities in our lives that need to be straightened out, God can skim them off the top and help us to grow. It's interesting that the word that they use here, tested or approved, is the Greek word dokimos. You know that archaeologists uh, exploring some of the first century Greek or Middle, Middle Eastern ruins, they unearth these uh, jugs and pots, many of them outside a, a little uh, store or shop that, that made pottery, clay pots, and they found a whole bunch of them that had cracked or broke when they went through the fire of the kiln. And so the potter would take those, those scraps of clay pottery and they just throw them in a big pile. So the, the archaeologists have found these huge piles of basically trash, jugs and pots and vessels that have been thrown out because they, they broke. They didn't survive the fiery trial. They were tested, but they didn't pass the test. And so that's why they would put them in this pile. But they also found pots that had come through the fire without cracking, without breaking. And, and those pots passed the test. And on the bottom of them, many of the pottery makers would stamp a word on the bottom of the pot. And the word that they stamped was documus, approved. Tested. It was like the good housekeeping seal of approval or something like that. And it's the word that Peter uses here to talk about faith that has been stamped, proven, tested. It's passed the test. The proof of your faith being more precious than gold which is perishable, even though tested by fire. So he's referring to the real deal, genuine, authentic faith. Not just superficial, it's deep, it's real. So, you find the same word, dokimus, in James uh, chapter 1, where he says, the testing of your faith produces endurance. When faith is tested, it produces something in us, endurance. Untested faith produces nothing in us. Faith was meant to be tested in order to produce something good. You've got to have this. It goes through this test in order to prove to us and show to us that, that um, we're going to be stronger in the end. We're going to come out on the other side. God doesn't test us in order to hurt us. He tests us in order to make us stronger. Can I hear an amen? For, it's, you know, we don't always like to hear about it, but it's true. The tests do make us stronger. You know, I'm not very good at building things, um, but all my married life, my wife has given me projects to work on, and, and I've been learning to do better at that. So one time, I was doing something fairly simple by a lot of your standards, I'm sure. I was out on the front porch hanging a porch swing up there, and uh, and so I wanted to make sure that this swing was going to hold people up, so when I started uh, getting ready to drill the holes for the hooks. I, I tapped along the ceiling of the porch to make sure I'd find the ceiling joists up there so I could really get a good solid anchor. And then I drilled the holes and then I, I, I screwed in two hooks in the holes that I drilled and then I, 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 I attached the chains to the hooks and then I put the swing on the end of the chain. And But you know, I didn't want to just 
I just didn't want to plop all my weight down on it to see if it was done right. I knew that I, I needed to, to check it out beforehand. I wanted to test it to make sure that it would hold up when, when it really counted. So, you know, you, you don't just... So, so in order to make sure that it was really tested, what do you think I did? <laughs> I did. I called my wife. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> like I say, I'm still learning, right? <laughs> um, so that's just like that porch swing. Is it going to hold up under pressure? That's our faith. Is it going to hold up under pressure? If it's been tested, then we know we're going to make it through. Let me just close with this and ask you a simple question. If you've been going through trials or problems, experiencing disappointments, painful situations in life, you're being like gold that's refined in the fire. And, and I would just encourage you, don't let those times of testing go to waste. Okay? Let God use them to purify you, to strengthen you, to give you a hope for the future. There's a better perspective. There's a better protection. There's a better faith. And all of that leads to a better you. Your faith, it says, will produce good things. Verse 7, praise and glory and honor. And you'll love Jesus more. As a result, you believe in the invisible spiritual things. It says even though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not see him now, but believe in him. All this comes because of a faith that's been tested and proven authentic. You'll be able to rejoice as you go through trials. You greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. One of the songs we were listening to on the way down today had the words in it, I'm going to dance in the darkness and I'm going to sing in the shadows. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Okay? Can you dance in the darkness? Can you sing in the shadows? You can if the joy of the Lord is your strength. You'll be able to rejoice despite trials. And finally, your salvation is going to be complete. You know that Jesus has saved us, but we're still in the process of being saved, and it's going to be complete one day. When you reach home in heaven, you're no longer an alien or a refugee in a godless world. You're going to be home in heaven with Jesus. At that time, it says, verse 9, obtaining as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. That's what we look forward to. We're not stuck in this world forever. We don't have to deal with problems till the end of the age we, we know that the end is coming when we're going to stand in Jesus' presence and there's a whole new world waiting for us. Can you just stand together? I want to just pray with you um, and, and trust that God's going to meet with your heart today, wherever you are at. I know there are people from all kinds of backgrounds and all kinds of situations going through different things. Some are doing well. Others are not doing so well. Some have done well in the past and now they're not, but others are doing um, uh, um, went through something in the past and now they're doing better. It doesn't matter where you are. I think that this is something that we can all grab hold of. So let's just bow our hearts before the Lord. God, I pray in Jesus' name that you would come and meet with us right now. Thank you for your word. Thank you for words that are timeless, that Peter wrote these words in the first century to people who were going through things and they're still applicable to us today in the 21st century when we go through things. And it might not be a, the enemy that's on the outside. It could be something like sickness or illness or financial problems. Whatever it might be that's knocking at the door, I pray, God, that you would give us your perspective and help us to see things from your point of view and to grab hold of the protection that you give to guard our hearts and our minds. And, Lord, just now I pray that you would speak to each one in this place directly to where they're at at this moment because they're all in different places. And let me just ask you a question. Do you need a better perspective? Do you want God's better protection? Would you like to have better faith? Will you give yourself to the Lord to do a new work in you? 
If you can say yes to any of those things, would you just lift a hand so I can especially pray a blessing over you right now? Yeah. Amen. God, each has responded in their own way to the situation that they're facing in their lives. And I can't know all of those things, but Lord, you do know. Right now, Lord, you are wrapping that person in your arms of love and care. Lord, you are ministering health and healing, hope and victory, confidence and assurance. Lord, right now you are enabling them to see things from a whole new perspective. You're lifting them up out of the muck to see things from your perspective, from your point of view, to grab hold of those protective uh, resources that you have to guard their hearts and their minds. Lord, you're increasing their faith and giving them a better confidence in you so that they can go out this day from this place and face the world that's out there, face the challenges and the problems that are there this week. And you will do a new work in them. And if you've prayed that prayer and opened your heart to the Lord, I just want to say in Jesus' name that God is doing something special and fresh in your life right now. He's giving you a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And I pray that that living hope will go with you today and tomorrow and all through this week. I pray that you would be instruments of God's grace and mercy, which is new every morning. And I pray this in Jesus' name. God bless all of those who could not be here today. And we pray, Lord, that you would uh, just lift them up, bring them back quickly, that they would help this congregation be stronger and vibrant and full of energy and life that you bring. Pray, God, for this church. Pray, Lord, that good things would happen as a result of them going through these tests and coming out the other side with confidence in you. I pray a blessing over this congregation and over its pastor and its leaders, elders and deacons and all those with responsibilities in ministry, all of those who are sharing your love with others. Pray for each member of this congregation, each one who attends. Pray, God, that you would do good works in their lives through these days in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a great day as you go in the presence of the Lord. Great to be with you today. Thank you, Rich. Uh, let's give him a round of applause. Good, good practical message. Um, I wanted to announce if you're involved in youth group, Jonathan wasn't here, but uh, tonight, youth group at 6 o'clock for all those of you that want to go to youth group. Next week, we will have uh, Jim and Renee Larson here. And some good news, uh, Jackie is going to be released from the hospital this afternoon. So.